All right, if you have your Bibles, uh, be turning to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 12, and uh, while you're turning there, I remind you to uh, pray for those that have been mentioned for sickness, and uh, uh, pray that the Lord will continue to heal Sister Joanne, that she might feel well, and that she uh, might maybe start traveling about on her own a bit. Exodus chapter 12. And we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Exodus 12, in the first verse, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speaking to all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it to, number, uh, to the number of souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, you shall take it out from the sheep and from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And then they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in the night, roast with fire, and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and watch care. Lord, we thank you and we truly praise you this morning for those that are here, but because we know by your word they're here by your appointment and not by their own free will, and we praise you for that. Lord God, honor your word this morning. That's what we stand most in need of. For you just simply to meet with us, uh, to fill this house with your presence, to convict us of our sin, encourage us along the way, and Lord, even save someone according to your mercy and grace. This morning we pray it. Amen. Now we'll be preaching this morning on uh, some bitter things. Now it is not... Um, it is not man's uh, natural impulse to like bitter stuff. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever done this, but have you ever tried to eat a little bit of cocoa just by itself? It's very, very, very bitter. But we all know at the very same amount of time, if it's all mixed in with the right stuff, it makes some of the most pleasant food there is. In other words, there's good uses for bitter things. There are good uses for things that are bitter. Now, in the first verse, as the Lord God of heaven is setting a covenant with Moses and how the uh, sacrifice was supposed to be handled, he takes him and Aaron aside, and the Lord spoke, uh, spake unto Moses and to Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, Now, I feel like why he kept both of them in that spot was for witness. Because time and time and time again, uh, the children of Israel would, uh, would question Moses and question Moses' plans. And I believe he put it this way because so that Aaron could say, no, I was there. And that's exactly what the way the Lord said to do it. In verse 2, he says, this month shall be uh, unto you the beginning of months. Now, that's another thing that is hard kind of to capture sometimes, but have you ever thought about, have you ever felt like you just needed a fresh start, something new, a new beginning, a new day? Well, that's where Israel was at, and on top of that, remember, for the last 400 years, they had been following the Egyptian calendar. Right. See, a lot of times we need to get, get our worldliness out, get our Egyptianness out, and go by with the word of God. And so this is a brand new opportunity. Have you ever thought that every day that you live, every morning that you wake up, the Lord God of heaven give you a new opportunity? A, a, a new, a new uh, day that can be dedicated to him. So the first thing that goes into this, uh, in, into 
through this uh, sacrifice was it's a brand new deal. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Now, let me say this. In the Jewish calendar, January is not their first month. Um, they don't have the same calendar that we do. We have a 12-month calendar. They have a 13-month calendar. And, and it's very, very different. But it was a new time to start. And on the first day of that month, they were to begin. He says in verse 3, speaking to all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, thou shalt take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Now, we, uh, he said, and I want you to see this is not a long thing. Uh, I've heard stories and suggestions, and I kind of get it, and, and used to take it with a lot more uh, truth than I do now, but we'll find this lamb did not stay in the house that long. It was only there for four days. Now, I don't know much about it, and I, I've never liked animals in my house very much. We had a little dog one time, and, and it stayed in the house about four or five years, and I was okay with it. But this is the thing, you're taking a wild animal into your house. Uh, as my mama said, it's going to tear up Jack. Can you imagine having a lamb in your house that's always been in the stable, that's always been in the barn, and all of a sudden in the middle of your home? That's what they were doing. This was their direction from God. Now, I'll show you a little something that I had never seen before, and it'd be good food for prayer this week and for study and for thought, but we'll get to that in a minute. So they were bringing this wild uh, animal into their home. Uh, verse 4. And if the household be too little for the lamb, because remember in verse 3 they're numbering things, they're numbering persons, and if the household be too little for the lamb, let him uh, and his neighbor next unto his house taking, take it according to the number of souls. Now, if you underline in your Bible, you underline that the number of souls because this is the Old Testament uh, example of particular redemption. It was, each lamb was for a specific number of people. In other words, it wasn't a general sacrifice. It was a specific, a particular sacrifice for a specific number of individuals. And, and it's, as it is still today, see, that's why you can't decide to follow Jesus because the thing of it is, if you're not under redemption, you're not going to follow him. Uh, it, you, you can't do that. So we see then that it was very a very specific way that this was to be uh, to be done. Verse 5, the qualification, the lamb shall be without blemish, a male from the first year. So that could have been up to 11 months old. It, 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 it was, you know, it, it wasn't that little bitty one. It could have been, and, and when you get a lamb a year old, they're up like this. Uh, we've raised them before, and they're not little bitty animals. And so it, it was from somewhere from birth to the first year. Couldn't be over that. The lamb shall be without blemish. In other words, no disease, no problems. A male of the first year, ye shall take it from the sheep. This is what nobody ever says. Or from the goats. Mm -hmm. Either one. You know, we, we often uh, get, uh, and I remember one time Brother Garth Smith made a note similar to that from a different section of the scripture. And I was like, well, goats are lost people. Not necessarily. Because he wanted a pure sacrifice. And if goats were unpure, he would have never said it. And you remember when the first sacrifice that relieved Ishmael, I mean, relieved uh, Isaac, um, it was a ram, which is a wild goat. And, and so we see then they could make the selection of either which one they wanted to take, and that would be their sacrifice for that amount of people. Uh, and you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the month, so it's in the house with you for four days, of the, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, that's a sundown, 
And they shall take of the blood and strike it up on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house wherein they shall eat it. And so they were to take the sacrificial blood and go up the door this way, across the top, and down this way, and everybody that was under the blood was preserved. And everybody that wasn't under the blood was consumed by the angel of death. And so that was their protection, and that's what they needed. Verse uh, 8, and they shall eat the flesh in the night. That means after sundown, after the blood is in its place, they are to begin eating it. Roast with fire. I like roasted meat, don't you? Next portion of the meal, unleavened bread. That's what we use here to observe the Lord's Supper with. It's not tasty. It's not good. If you're looking for uh, a hot biscuit, it's plain. It, it, it is routine. It, it, it isn't even really that palatable. So the meal they ha were having uh, wasn't Sunday morning meeting meal. It was just the, it was just to typify who it was to recognize. The next element of the meal, and with bitter herbs. Now notice it didn't say to season the meat with herbs. That was the third item in the meal. They would have roasted meat, they would have unleavened bread, and then get you a little bit of herb and put it in your mouth. And you know why? Because some things in the Word of God is good and we're ready to go, woo -hoo! And some things in the Word of God is just distasteful to mankind. Now, I don't know uh, uh, exactly what herbs that they were taking. It probably was multiple, but it had to be it had to be all bitter. Now, on the very same thing as I was talking about tasting chocolate, uh, have you ever looked in your cabinet and got out some herbs and just popped them in your mouth? What about parsley? What about cumin? Just to just man, just throw it in your mouth. And, mm. None of them are good by themselves. They're for seasoning, right? Yeah. But he says, I want you to eat them. I want you to get the most bitter one you can find, and I want you to eat it with this meal. And, and so we find then that sometimes what God wants for us is something better that we can remember it by. You know what? When you have trouble and when you have problems, it's a better, better time for a while, but you remember that better time because God wants you to eat it and something in there he wants you to see. Listen, these people that preach you health and wealth, Billy, uh, uh, them swaggers and, and, you know, all the uh, uh, famous preachers, Listen, if you ever know, they never preach on the bitterness that this life has. But you know what? The bitterness of life is just a reality. I don't care if you've been saved for 50 years. You're not going to be doing cartwheels all the time. Because you know what? Life happens. It really does. And so as they're looking at their meal, they were to uh, eat these bitter herbs along with it. As they went along. Then he says in verse 9, eat it not raw, which makes sense, nor sodden it all with water. They couldn't, they couldn't uh, water it down, as the old saying goes. They couldn't make soup out of it. But roast with fire, just on an open pit. Now this is the good part. His head with his yeah. legs. And the protuberance, which means the intestines thereof. Yeah. Yum, yum. So, uh, now I, I, I may be redneck, but at least it's taken out. I like souse, head cheese, the Yankees call it. And, uh, but I don't think that I could just eat the head. And they would eat every bit of it. Yeah. The good and the bad. And listen, uh, I've even I've never ate them, but I've always wanted to. I, I'd like to try chitlins, which is fried intestines, for those of you that don't know. Uh, but I certainly want to, wouldn't want to eat them before they were cleaned up mm -hmm. and at least taken out of the animal. But that's how they were to eat it. See, 
sometimes things that God wants for us is just not pleasant, is it? Right. J j just not the most wonderful thing to think about. But in that, we see the picture that they were under the blood. So sometimes there's the sweet and sometimes there's the bitter. There's the fun days and there are the days that are not so great. Now go with me to the little book of Ruth. Ruth chapter 1. Ruth chapter 1, and uh, we're going to begin reading in verse 19. Ruth chapter 1, in verse 19, the Bible says this, So they too, meaning uh, Naomi and Ruth, so they too went until they, came, went until they came to Bethlehem, and it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem, all the city was moved about them, and they said, Is this Naomi? Is, is this her? Is, is this the individual that left? Now, I know all of you know, but just to remember, to remind you, Naomi means sweet. Now, if there's any part of a diet that I love, it's sweets. Uh, uh, you know, and I always says it's a good illustration of the depravity of man, but because before I became diabetic, I really could take them or leave them, and after I became diabetic, that's all I wanted. See, uh, so everybody loves a nice sweet thing, and, and apparently before they left on this excursion, Naomi was such a sweet lady that the name stuck. Now, we think that Naomi, and I, I know some Naomi's, and uh, uh, we, we think that is just a name for us because it comes from the Bible, but he was literally calling her sweet. Right. I mean, in the English name, can you imagine naming your daughter sweet? This is my daughter sweet, and people look at you like you're crazy, but that's literally what her name was. It was sweet. And, and, and so when she arrives back, and, and you can read what she went through, listen, Naomi Sweet had been through the ringer washer. She had gone through some things. She lost her husband. She lost both of her sons, all because, you know what? And if you read that, Naomi was guiding the thing. Listen, women, it's not your place to guide the home. Naomi was in the driver's seat, and you see how she ended up, right? And, and that may sound rough, but it is, it is the gospel truth. And, and so we find then that even her visage or her appearance had been changed. Say, so, is this sweet? Now you think about what she went through. Is that sweet? Is, is burying two children sweet? Certainly not. Is letting your, your husband to rest sweet? No, no. Uh, so what Naomi found, that money really didn't matter that much. What mattered in life is people. Now notice how she answers her neighbors. And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi or sweet, but call me Mara. For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. Now, you can find this word Mara in another place in your Bible, and in that place it's spelled M-A-R-A-H, instead of just M-A-R-A. And you remember when the Israelites were traveling through the, the wilderness, and they finally got to a stream of water, and they got to the water, and they drunk it, and it was bitter. Yeah. And they said, that stream's name is Mara. Now, this is the reason why. And we always like, why did it happen this way? See, it wasn't much long after they went to Mara, that Moses spoke to a stone, and water came gushing forth. See, they found out for sure where water came from, didn't they? See, a lot of times uh, we have to go through some bitter times to see how big and how wonderful and how holy our God really is. And so we find that that Naomi comes back a bitter woman, upset, mad at God. Notice what she says in verse 21. I went out full. Now, do you remember why they went? You can read verses 1 through 6 this week. The reason they went out is because they didn't think there was enough work and enough good things at home. 
But see, Naomi learned, hey, I went out full. I went out with a good husband. I went out with two fine sons. And I came home with nothing. Now let me say this. Naomi still hadn't learned her lesson. You ever feel like that, you know, you're being beat up and beat up and beat up over the same thing again and again and again? Well, maybe you ain't learned a lesson yet. Because, see, she did bring something back. Yes, she did. She brought back a little idolatrous woman named Ruth who cherished the things of God and is in the line of David, David's grandmother, and in the line of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Maybe you need to look around. Maybe you're not nearly as bitter as you think you are. Maybe, maybe there's sweetness in your life that you don't even recognize, that you can't even see. And, and, and so we find then that Naomi's still not necessarily hitting on all cylinders. I went out full and the Lord brought me home again empty. And then, why then calling you me Naomi or sweet, saying the Lord have testified against me, and the Almighty have afflicted me. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. So we find then, sometimes, it's good for us to eat bitter things. Now, it's not pal palatable to the flesh, because, but it's often medicinal. It, it often helps us. Uh, uh, I remember Donna got into essential oils one time, and uh, they're all made out of herbs. And uh, she's, uh, I, I had an asthma attack. I hadn't had one in, in years, probably 30 years or more. And she says, I can help you. And she, she brought this essential oil in and she rubbed it on them and it was just like fire. Just burn, I mean, uh, winter green. I think so. I mean, I felt like I was on fire. But you know what? It took care of the problem. I could breathe well again. Cause so, sometimes what we need is the bitter. Sometimes what we need is it, things in our lives to make us understand and know truly that God is God. He's on the throne and he doeth all things well. We, we need to eat a little bit of the bitter. Now, look with me in Esther. Esther chapter 4 in the very first verse. Esther chapter 4 in the very first verse. The Bible says, when Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out in the midst of the city and cried with a loud and a bitter cry. Now, the message that he got was this. They were already in captivity. The Israelites were a what was a captive nation. They were slaves in a different place. They're no longer in Egypt, but they're in a different place. And the ruler says, listen, we're going to kill all the Jews. Every one of them came out of Israel, they're dead. You know, what, what if the Oryx came out today, hey, we're going to kill all the Baptists. You say, well, that's stupid. It ain't as stupid as you think it is. What if we're going to kill all the people that denounce sin? You know, this is what I found. Everybody's okay with your beliefs as long as it don't even infringe in on them. And, but when you begin to say, you know what? Sodomy is a sin according to the Bible. Then you begin to get a little upheaval. When, 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 you, began, when you began to say, hey, you know what? Sunday is the Lord's day and it belongs to him. Him alone. We don't need to interfere with that. You're going to start getting a little upheaval then. They're not going to be ready for the group of it. So, you know, one of these days what happened to Mordecai very much could happen to us. It could be that uh, the governor may eat up and says, listen, if they don't comply, they're all going to die. 
And so we find that what Mordecai does, he does what the Jews are supposed to do, and, and, and he he visually shows his bitterness and, and his upset over what has happened. Verse two, and came even before the king's gate. So he met, he he moved his bitter cry right up into the king's gate. And you know why he did that? He knew within the king's gate that he had Esther. Um, or Hadassah, as her Jewish name is, he had an advocate inside the kingdom. This morning, isn't it a wonderful thing that you have an advocate inside the kingdom? That you have the Lord Jesus Christ who sits right at the right hand of the Father and, and is your advocate and it, it is your, it is a person that goes to bat for you is the one that says, you know what? He's mine. And that's what Mordecai was looking for. A willing advocate. And so he gets right at the gate so that maybe <laughs> Esther can look out her window and see him all sprawled out and in his black clothing and pleading before the Lord. Verse 2. And verse, uh, verse 2. And even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth, and in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent a raiment to clothe Mordecai, and to take away his sackcloth from him. But he received it not. Now, I want you to see what uh, Esther, what Hadassah was wanting to do was to smooth things over. You know what? We, we live in a day of smoothing things over, don't we? Nothing's wrong and everything is right, right? You know what that is? It's smoothing things over. You know what? Saying people that have three or four wives... Uh, you know, you know, you get down on sodomites, but what about people with multiple wives and multiple husbands? What, but you know, what, what about that's just as much of a sin the way that I understand from the Bible. Why do we smooth her over? I tell you, because we don't want to hear from anybody else. We want a we want a full house, do we not? Talking about Billy Graham a little bit ago. You know what? He's supposed to be such a great Southern Baptist preacher. Let me tell you a little something about what he did. When he had his big crusades, when he came down front, you know, and they was all walking like, a, like they were going to get uh, supper. When he got down there, there was an individual who says, what denomination are you? I'm Presbyterian. Send him over to a Presbyterian. What denomination are you? I'm Catholic. You go right over there. I'm Methodist. We're right here. You know, they didn't need someone to tell them how good that they were and that they were right where they were at. What those individuals needed was the gospel. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, we live in a day and age today just like Mordecai. Uh, all that Esther wanted to do was smooth things over. You know what? That only works for a very short amount of time. And then whatever the problem is, it's going to come right on up to the top. So we find then that, and, and, and you know the rest of the story, <laughs> Hadassah or uh, Esther kind of repents and says, listen, I'm going into the king, and if I perish, I perish. See, that's where we need to be today. We need to take the bitter and let the result happen. When she realized her people was dying, and you know what? Oh, Mordecai had to shoot straight with her. You know, sometimes as a preacher, I just have to shoot straight with my people. And, and he shot straight with her and said, you listen, you listen, Hadassah. It may be that the Lord had lifted thee up for such a time as this. And then he says, <laughs> and he, not these words, but he says, but you know what? If you don't go to bat for us, the Lord will rise up another way. But what's going to happen to you? See, she didn't want the bitterness, did she? Old Hadassah, Esther, she, she didn't know what was going to be when she went in there and the king hadn't invited her. 
What she needed was a good dose of bitterness. You know, you know what the Lord's people need today is just take the word of God for exactly what it is and go and, and go with it when it's sweet and it's set and it shows us the beauties of heaven to come. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And whenever it shows us that our lives are against the word of God and need to be brought back into line, yes, that's bitter, but we need to say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. We need to take both together and just feast on it. The very best we can. Job. You know, Job had some real issues. Job loved the Lord, but Job didn't have an easy trot, did he? Job loved the Lord and he served the Lord, but he did have some issues. You know what the very worst thing you could do to your children is to spoil them. Yeah. See, I personally believe that his seven sons and his three daughters were spoiled rotten. Remember, one well, of the very opening things, he's out there offering a sacrifice. It may be that my children have sinned. He knew what they were doing. He wasn't no dummy. They was down there partying at, at the oldest brother's house. You know what? Very, it's bitter, but the very best thing you can, he could have went down there and says, you know, knocked on the oldest brother's door and saying, y'all living like dogs. Just tell them the truth. But you know what? It's a very bitter thing. You imagine saying that to your children. It's bitter, isn't it? Now, it's what's best for them, but it's bitter. And so we find then as the Lord's people, sometimes it's easy uh, to take the sweet way out, to take the way that doesn't hurt. So in the book of Job, chapter 3, verse 20, Job's beginning to lament. Wherefore, Job 3.20, Wherefore is the life given to him that is in misery and life unto the bitter soul? Now we begin to see some things that are exclusive to the people that are in a bitter situation. Notice that uh, the first thing it says is, Wherefore is life given to him that is in misery? You know, uh, you can't see. You remember the Lord Jesus Christ says in the first, uh, in the Gospel of John, the first chapter, I am the way. Uh, he says, I am the light. I am the word. And here Job says, you can't ever see that if you don't see the misery. See, if you've never been convicted of your sin and been made miserable by the word of God, you ain't never been saved. Listen, hey, Salvation is not a hell escape way. That, that it is not a way just to avoid the flames of hell. Salvation is brought by the Almighty. Salvation is brought by the Lord uh, and, and His mighty works. And so we find then that we as the Lord's people, uh, we need to understand that the, the bitterness, the... The difficult times have a, pers uh, a purpose. Uh, it, it has a reasoning behind it, and we should always remember that. Wherefore is the light given unto him that is in, mis in misery, and life unto the bitter in soul? So I want you to see that the Bible says here that life is only given to those, and that means spiritual life, Life is given to those bitter in soul. You ever experienced bitterness in soul? Well, you better have. Because I don't think if you've ever experienced it, you're probably not saved. See, it's better to learn that you're helpless. Is it not? That's one thing I don't like about this. You know, you just accept Jesus. You know, there's nothing bitter about that, is it? I'd accept a box of chocolates, wouldn't you? That, that there's no truth in that. But when you find out that you're a helpless, ungodly sinner, that's a bitter pill to swallow. When you find out there's no hope whatsoever for you except for the mercy of God, that is a bitter pill to swallow. When you find out good works won't do it, that's a bitter pill. When you find baptism is nothing, that's a bitter pill to swallow. 
See, there's some good things that come from bitterness, isn't it? We can learn the character of the Almighty. We can learn uh, the, the true means to redemption and salvation. But it's a bitter course to go. It's a difficult thing to do. Uh, Job chapter 7. Job chapter 7, verse 11. Job 7, 11, the Bible says, Wherefore, I will not refrain my mouth. In other words, he was going to speak. He was going to say some things. Therefore, I will not refrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. You know, uh, sometimes when, when those bitter times come, we, we have to go to God, don't we? When, when, when the news is all bad, who else can you go to? There's not a friend like the Lord Jesus Christ. There's none like unto him. When, when there's absolutely problem upon problem upon problem, who are you going to come to? What are you going to do? See, that's when we have to rely entirely on the Lord Jesus Christ. It, you know, it's a good thing. You know, uh, this is what's going on in my life. I don't have money for my bills. I'm sick. I ain't even able to work. Just lay it out there before your Lord. See, that, that's getting rid of your bitterness, isn't it? I don't like so-and-so. You know what? If there's somebody that you don't like, the very best thing to do is take it before the Lord. Uh, you know why? Because that will make it bit, it'll make you bitter, and you'll carry that thing for the rest of your life. Yeah. Put it out there before the Lord. Let, let Him take care of it. Let, let Him do what He's amazingly well with. And, and so you think about all the trials of Job and everything that he had gone through. He says, listen, I'm going to pour it out before my God. I'm going to pour this thing that's made me so bitter. Leaving, losing my wealth. Losing my children. Losing everything that I have. And I'm sitting here like a pauper scraping uh, my sores with a, with, with, with a pot. I'm going to lay that out before the Lord. And then his wife comes up to him and says, listen, you know what? You need just to curse God and die. He says, I'm going to pour it out before the Lord. You know, though, and, and, and when he, he was so blessed of God when it was over with that the real problem came out. And the real problem was this. He didn't understand the provision of God. He didn't understand, and uh, at the end of the book of Job, he finally realizes all things come from God. And he was restored over and over and over again. He had a new set of ten children. He had new wealth. His wife had got herself right, and he had left the bitterness to go to glory. Uh, one more place, Job 21. Job 21 and verse 25. The Bible says that another died in the bitterness of his soul and never eateth with pleasure. Now, the worst thing that can happen to you is to die bitter. Right. Listen, I, I've seen a lot of people die in my life. And I, I, I've seen people take hate to the grave with them. Just unforgiving. Just, you know, um, I had one, I, a lady, I, I was taking care of her husband, but I knew this woman all my life. She grew up in Carlisle, and uh, she's an older lady. She's older than my mother, and I, I remember her well, and she always had a sassy, smart-aleck attitude. Just that, that was her character. Didn't really like the woman myself, and uh, she came down with cancer. And I was talking to her one day, and I said, you know, uh, she says, my church has let me down. And I wanted to say, well, so-and-so, you've let your church down because you ain't been there in 30 years. Who, who let who down? But you know what? This woman, she complained about her children. She complained about her grandchildren. 
this woman died in the bitterness of soul. You know, if you don't cough that thing up and forgive people, you'll die just like this woman I'm talking about died. And just bitterness of soul. You know what? Um, you ever thought about this? Sin, whether it's your sin or, or, or my sin, someone offended you, it's going to make you bitter, isn't it? If you sin and you fall, it's going to it's going to interfere your relationship with the Lord if somebody sins against you. Because the Bible has a lot. The Bible has a lot that says if thy brother sin against thee, you, you you just hang on to it and see how happy you are when it's, when you're in that deathbed over there. See what I'm saying? Uh, sometimes the very best thing we can do is just forgive them and say, you know what, I forgive you. Right now, uh, take away some bitterness with it. And so we find we find Job starting to get things figured out a bit and starting to see where his relationship really was with the Lord. He says, And another died in bitterness of soul and never with pleasure. You know what? We have so many pleasures in this life. And I'm not talking about houses and land and automobiles. Pleasures of just your family. Pleasures uh, that we never even recognize. Clearness of air. I remember one time years ago, uh, a boy down in Carlisle, and I had a friend that was from Atlanta, and he'd come down ever, he'd come up every year from Atlanta to uh, spend time with his great grandmother that lived there at Carlisle. And uh, he came up to the house and uh, rapped on the door, and I was like, hey, Chris, go on in. He goes, I don't want to come in right now. Do you smell that? So I stepped on the porch and I'm like, what? And I was doing like this. I was like, I don't want you to smell that. He says, it's so fresh and clean. And I was like, and he's talking about the air. Something I had never even thought about. Our house is about from here to that woods from the creek. And, and it, is a, it is a good smell, that fresh creek water. And, and you know what? I thought, that's one thing I've never even realized. I, I've lived on this creek my whole life and never even thought about it. Yeah. And... And we, we're the same way, are we not? You know what? If you don't begin to start recognizing a few of those things, you'll die bitter too. And I'm going to close, but let me say this. Don't let other people make you bitter. You're going to have some hard times. You're going to have some difficulty. But your response to it is what is important. Don't let people make you bitter. You know, uh, for my own, my own self, I'll say this. The sweetest words when I knew I had been forgiven of my sins, the sweetest words I ever heard were, I forgive. And we need to be the exact same way. We can put some of that back out, too.